Okay. Uh, you know, bronchoscopy started a uh, long time ago. The first rigid bronchoscopy was started. Uh, so, uh, Killian did the first uh, rigid bronchoscopy in 1897, and Ikeda started the flexible bronchoscopy in 1970. And uh, since there, then, the numbers are growing and growing. Uh, this is what uh, our experience is, which is, I'm sure, half or, or less than what you have in the States. Uh, the numbers of bronchoscopies are growing every year from, uh, uh, in all Israel and especially in our center. Uh, last year we did uh, 1,540 bronchoscopy. We have just one bronchoscopy suite, so it's going to be it's very uh, tight. I believe in Israel we are doing about 4,000 pr procedures per year. And the, there is a recent uh, survey in, uh, from Japan and uh, the Japanese are very good. They started the whole thing and uh, uh, they uh, surveyed 103,000 procedures in 2010, 483 centers. They have a 90% uh, 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 90 of the centers uh, reported to them. It's a nice number. And the complication rate was uh, said to be between 0.5 and 2 percent. I think I take these numbers uh, very cautiously because nobody likes to uh, report their uh, complications. And like uh, when the patient comes and you ask him how much do you smoke and he says 40 pack here and you write down 80 pack here because <laughs> so the complication is about the same. Uh, you have to double it at least. And all the reports about all the complications are really underestimation of the problem, I believe. Uh, mortality in this uh, group was four cases uh, for the whole 100,000 uh, uh, bronchoscopies. I think there are probably more and not, uh, maybe it was not in the bronchoscopy room at the same time the four that died, but if you consider two, three days later or uh, a sepsis that the patient dies and a week later it's still death from the bronchoscopy. So it's more than four cases per uh, 100,000. If you do a, a therapeutic bronchoscopy, a more invasive procedure, they had just one death in 3,000 uh, cases. I think it's probably more. Uh, the number should be probably two or three per uh, 0 0.09 or 0 0.01, 0 0.1 percent uh, death rates. Um, there was a report about uh, transplant patients. We do a lot of uh, transplant bronchoscopies. It takes a big part of our experience. And in Toronto, <coughs> uh, in San Francisco, they, they looked at uh, 3,700 3, uh, procedure. Of those, uh, 2,000 were transbronchial biopsies. Very, very low rate of uh, uh, complications. Bleeding was in nine cases out of the 2,000, very low. Uh, doesn't, it wasn't important whether the physician was a, an expert or a trainee with an expert next to him. Also, very low rate of pneumothoraxes and uh, uh, infections and, and so forth. So it's a very, it's considered very safe procedure. What type, uh, kind of uh, complications we have? Um, uh, sedation is a major problem and uh, in some centers uh, you have an anesthesiologist next to you I guess in the, the biggest centers we don't have that uh, uh, option we have lack of anesthesiologists in the operating room so uh, not to speak about getting one to the bronchoscopy suite so all the medications that we are giving can cause uh, can sedate the patient can uh, put him to sleep and CO2 may rise and he can go into uh, respiratory failure. Bronchospasm, we heard about the uh, uh, asthma patients or the COPD patients. This is something you have to, to watch um, and prepare the patient. If the patient is asthmatic, not, we not only give him <coughs> bronchodilators, we also give him some steroids prior to the procedure. We heard about the cardiac and I'll give you some examples and infection of course 
if you uh, play in the airways where the, there is some bacteria going on, you can spread them in the bloodstream. Uh, oh, from that bedside of uh, the, the bronchoscopy, you can get a lot of publications. That's a positive side of the, of the field. So you can get a nice CV just from writing the complications. But it's important that the complication will come out in a positive way. I mean, that patient will recover. Then you can report it n and feel good about it. So uh, we have, I don't know if Dr. Irwin is here. At the time, we, we could get easy papers into chest. So uh, we had a few cases. Um, we had coronary spasm during uh, our, our patient work. It was a patient uh, with a static uh, uh, breast carcinoma. Suddenly, complete heart block. She needed a temporary pacemaker, but it reco she recovered very nicely. That's why the paper was accepted. <laughs> okay. Uh, we had a patient uh, post splenectomy, and he, uh, he died from Haemophilus influenza infection, uh, bacteremia, septicemia, and uh, it has been reported before, so it's, uh, it's a good idea to put these patients on antibiotic prior to the procedure. Uh, we further looked at myocardial ischemia. Um, I had Dr. Matot working with me. She's now the head of anesthesia in Ichilo, and she was a very uh, easy writer, and uh, we did this nice study, and we found that myocardial ischemia uh, with an EKG during the uh, bronchoscopy is a common thing, especially if the blood pressure and tachycardia is, is high. So the most important uh, thing about these patients, a cardiac patient, to keep them on their medications, blood pressure control before the, the procedure and during the procedure. Um, we are now using more and more uh, proper form. And, uh, I don't know in the States what the trend is, you know, we did uh, a lot of, uh, we have a lot of experience with midazolam and alfentanil, but we found that propofol is uh, not only a better sedative, but also uh, it's a short one, shorter than the midazolam, and it causes less CO2 retention. And we did a study uh, with use of the uh, transcutaneo uh, uh, CO2. Uh, I believe it's going to be a mandatory thing in every bronchoscopy room. If you have it on your ear, you get a very accurate uh, measurement of your CO2. It's really one-to-one -one with the blood PCO2. It's not the entire. And uh, we found that, if you can see the graph, this is midazolam and fentanyl CO2, and this is propofol CO2 just at the end of the procedure. And the fall in CO2 is uh, very quick um, as compared to the midazolam. So I believe uh, it's, it's safer to use propofol than domicum uh, or midazolam and fentanyl. Laryngeal mask, I know you have, uh, David, you have a lot of experience. I don't have a lot of experience <coughs> with that, but in difficult cases, I believe uh, it's a good uh, tool and uh, it can keep the patient ventilated very uh, well and um, you can, uh, it's easy to perform, so I hear, uh, but you need an anesthesiologist with you and if you don't have one, then it's a, it's a problem. Uh, pneum pneumothorax, what could be the worst case uh, scenario uh, that, like we had uh, last week, a, a case, very large pneumothorax, she needed a chest drain, but the, we asked at least, get, let's get the biopsy. The biopsy was negative, of course, and the patient husband actually was a, a lawyer, and uh, <laughs> this is the worst case uh, that you can expect. Um, here's a post-TBNA pneumothorax, I, again, uh, a nice publication for a very common uh, uh, complication because the, the picture was so nice. Uh, he had a, a massive hydro uh, uh, pneumothor medias pneumomediastinum medastinum, and also in the abdomen. 
So it resolved, everything was okay, that's why again it was accepted. Now, uh, you discussed it, do we need a chest uh, radiograph post uh, transmural calvati? So we examined it uh, with uh, Dr. Izvitsky, I don't know if he's here. Uh, we checked um, uh, th th 350 TBVs, and, and if uh, the, we, we looked if the patient was symptomatic or not, and then we looked at the at the X-ray. And uh, our conclusion was that routine chest X-ray is not needed, and unless uh, we uh, we do it all under fluoroscopy, so we have some control during the procedure. If the patient is asymptomatic, there is no need for routine TBB. I don't know if this will hold in court, but the paper can give some backup for for patients. Uh, and if you look at the literature, the numbers of uh, pneumothorax post TBB varies, and uh, we had 2.9%. Uh, we were quite uh, high, but uh, most of the series showed 1%, 0.5%. But uh, as I said, you should double it, and this is the, the probably the right number, 1 to 6%. It's uh, uh, low incidence but if the pneumothorax is small you don't have to do anything just bring the patient in in a day or two for follow-up x-ray um, and if it's a large uh, pneumothorax put a drain in and you solve the problem and you should be uh, pray you should pray you are lucky with the biopsy to get a, a result so this is not a major issue hemoptysis is a major uh, problem because it can cause death, uh, and I think that the common cause of death post bronchoscopy is from uh, massive hemoptysis, um, and it's uh, it's common. This at least from the old literature, uh, cavitary lesions we see it less and less, uh, aspergillus, uh, mucor, uh, thing areas that are involving vascular uh, lesions, and you, when you bite them, you uh, can get uh, hemoptysis. Um, incidence in the literature between 0.9 and 1.9, um, but again, I think it's higher. And how do you manage it? Uh, I think uh, prevention is the is the major thing, but sometimes whatever you do, you can get uh, bleeding. Uh, I think the control of the systemic blood pressure is the most important part uh, uh, to prevent the severe bleeding and you should instruct the patient ahead take stop your aspirin and clavix but take your antihypertensive medication in uh, the morning of the bronchoscopy with a little some water and um, uh, you have to monitor the blood pressure through the procedure and we use labetalol when we see elevation of the blood pressure and we uh, it's a very short acting and very good control immediate control of the blood pressure Coagulopathy, we heard the problem, trying not to, to get the patient with INR of uh, 7 and platelets be below 10,000, but the, the questions are, what is the limit? 50,000 thrombocytes usually is uh, quoted. Uh, if you have below that, you have to prepare the patient with thrombocytes. And sedation, good sedation will prevent um, uh, Rest. Uh, uh, the patient is not at rest. He's, he's moving around. His, he will raise his blood pressure and he will bleed. So you have. You need to get very good sedation to prevent bleeding. Management. Management is. Uh, there is no protocol for management of uh, uh, bleeding, but um, you have several uh, ways to control the bleeding. You can escort some adrenaline on top of the area. Uh, it's, it can help in very localized lesions, but if you, if you did the uh, transbronchial biopsy far down the, the airway and you escort lidocaine, you don't know where it's going to go. But this is something very uh, quoted and recommended. Cold water or ice wa water is also an old trick which works. Hexacapone Tansenamic acid. Uh, actually, there was a report from uh, Ramba, and uh, Dr. Salomonov is here, um, and it's a it's a good drug to clot blood in the airway. 
Um, and I have also very good experience with that. The problem is when you have a massive bleeding, you can get a large clot that can obstruct the airway. So it has a plus and a minus. Uh, Fogarty balloon is a good, uh, the, something you must have in your bronchoscopy room for such cases. You, have, you can occlude the segment that is bleeding and by that saving the other uh, area, the, the other lung, that it can ventilate uh, properly. And you have to put it down quickly and uh, hold it uh, inflated. Uh, one side with, uh, ventilation is also an option. You, you're not worried about the bleeding as much as the suffocation of the, of the other lung. So if you can keep one lung open, that's the main trick. Um, and angular embolization is also an option. Uh, we just had a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago, a case from uh, uh, Amir, uh, a patient that was bleeding uh, from the right middle lobe. Uh, nothing helped locally, and he put uh, a bronchial blocker into this area and uh, brought him, brought the, uh, the lady down to to our center for an angiogram and we found a very large bronchial artery and that was uh, occluded and she uh, recovered. You, we should report it, it she recovered. Okay, okay Fogarty balloon, very easy to apply. Um, you inflate it in the right uh, area. And bronchial blockers, also uh, you have uh, tubes with the blocker uh, uh, attached to it and you can put it in in a main uh, bronchi or a segmental if you, uh, if you need a, a smaller one. Now one of the, the myths of uh, bronchoscopy, don't do biopsies for uh, renal cell carcinoma uh, metastasis because they bleed and carcinoid. So I uh, don't think it's true. You have to do it very carefully. You have a good laser device or cauterization. So this is uh, this was the patient with RCC obstructing the right main bronchus. We uh, worked very slowly, very carefully, and we opened it, and very little bleeding. Again, carcinoid, very nice tumor here. Uh, we resected it completely with a telectasis of the right middle lobe. We resected it completely, and this is three months later. Nothing was there. I'm following him, I think, uh, five years now. Every year he comes for follow up bronchoscopy. He didn't need surgery and he, he didn't bleed like uh, a, a larger series of uh, carcinoids that we, we reported. Here's another one. You know, you work with the laser, you get <coughs> clear, a clear airway, no significant bleeding. Again, another one, a very large carcinoid in the, the right main bronchus. He could, uh, this lady should have, uh, a few years ago we were sent her to surgery for pneumonectomy or sleeve resection and uh, we opened it very nicely with a laser without significant bleeding. If you work slowly with control, you can save it. Okay, and the last, I think my time is out, but just a few slides about complications of metal stents. Metal stents uh, are very easy to deploy in the airway. They give you immediate relief. It's, it's fantastic. But if you follow the patient, you get granulation tissue over time, and uh, sometimes uh, it causes a lot of trouble. So uh, in America, I think uh, the FDA have uh, put a black box on it. But still, um, in some cases, you don't have other choices because they are very old. They refuse surgery or uh, general anesthesia, so you do it. So uh, I'll go over it quickly. Uh, this is the problem, especially subglottic stenosis, post intubation. You do one laser, two laser, three lasers, it comes again, and a uh, patient is not a candidate for surgery. Then you put a stand in, you get a very nice uh, picture uh, and, and relief of his breathing. And we have a follow-up of a uh, large group, 114. Dr. Nader wrote this paper. And we have follow-up up to 10 years in, in many cases. If you uh, bring the patient in 
and you clean the, uh, the stents every three, six months, depends on the case. You can keep the metal stent open. And in some cases, you need more than that. And you need, what we use is brachytherapy. We radiate inside the, the stent and we uh, prevent the granulation tissue to grow. Here, 29 cases that we did. And now it's kind of our routine. If you need a metal stent, and you do a few weeks later, you do a, a brachytherapy, and uh, this is about to be published. Good results, of course, uh, the except. And, and the stents can cause obstruction of the right upper lobe, so you, we, we can make a window, either with laser, you can burn the stent with the laser, or dilate it with a balloon. And we have uh, uh, quite a big series. Now, uh, post-transplant patient, particularly, you need the right upper lobe opening. And here's uh, another caveat. A patient, she had a, a small cell carcinoma. Uh, she obstructed the right main bronchus. We put one stent, metal stent, down here. And then she obstructed the other side. So we put another stent in the left main uh, bronchus, which was obstructing the right. So we, uh, we burned with laser and dilated with the balloon a hole to the right. And so we had uh, two stents uh, side by side. Uh, she survived, I think, six months, and then she died from her disease. And co I conclude, bronchoscopy is a growing field of medical toys. Every few months you hear another toy, another trick. Uh, each intervention may cause complications. Uh, the common problems are air airway control and uh, uh, infection, pneumothorax and hemoptysis. And with more experience, patient selection and better skills, our rate complication will decrease, but will never disappear completely. Uh, but the only way that the complication uh, will disappear completely is when we retire. That was the last uh, line. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.